join with me in welcoming Sir Peter to going to say some heretical things, so we shouldn't listen to anything I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes or so. The one thing I certainly never would have been on is any of these honours boards. My interest in things sporting when I was at the school was remote, to say the least. Um, I've been asked to talk about something boring, which is basically myself, which I find a rather boring topic, so I will probably wander in a few different directions. I want to start by say, it's basically giving you, I don't know, you tell me if you can hear it. Can you hear all right? Maybe yeah, a little maybe bit. They can hear it. Can, the boys can hear it. Um, so maybe a little bit. <laughs> First is, don't think too much about the future. I find that too many young people worry too much about their future. If you're a bright kid, and all of you are bright kids, opportunities will emerge for you, you'll make your own luck, and you should grab the opportunities as they emerge. And I'll explain why I say that in a moment. Because to think about the future and to pretend we know what the future will look like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, is unrealistic. The pace of change is so fast, in society, with technology, and everything else, that to pretend that you will know what your long-term career is going to be with certainty now is crazy. Things are going to change, and my career has changed five, six, seven, eight, nine times over my lifespan, which has been a far more stable environment than the environment you're going to face. What you're using education to do is to prepare yourself to make the choices when those opportunities emerge. You cannot possibly plan everything about your life into the future now. What you've got to do is prepare yourself for a career which will have several changes in it, in all probability, for all sorts of reasons. There'll be disruptive technologies, things that might look as if they're enormously profitable things to be in now, may not be in 20 years' time. I was watching TV the other night, an interview with Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Quite openly says that sometime in the, near fu in the future, Amazon will disappear. Somewhere in the next 10, 20, 30 years, the model we have of internet shopping as we know now will be replaced by something else. We have no idea what it will be, but it will be replaced. And that's the kind of environment we're living in where science and technology are leading to lots of disruptive changes, many of which cannot be predicted. The second point I want to make is mentorship. Across your careers, you will come to point, branch points, decision points, where you're not sure what to do or where the issues are complex. Some of the most important people you can have in your life are not necessarily your parents or your grandparents. They are people who you respect because they, you have worked with them or because they have, they are more senior to you. And developing close relationships with people, with a person or people you trust to give you objective, to question your decision making objectively can help you make decisions a lot better. My mentor was 89 at the moment. He's still alive, he's still very functional. He happens to be one of the greatest scientists in North America. I still talk to him every month or so. If I want to get a viewpoint on what I might do in a science situation, the mere fact I have somebody who I respect who has some wise words to say and has no stake in the decision beyond being supportive of me is a very important role. Now, they're not the kind of things you would expect a person like me necessarily to be saying to you, but I think those two points are going to be critical to anybody who's really talented in this much more complicated world that's now emerging. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. 
I went to grammar. I was probably, like m many of you in the room, considered a nerd. Uh, I wasn't very really interested in the stuff that goes out on these fields here. I was interested primarily in, 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 in things like uh, science, math, what we used to call applied mathematics, I don't know what you call it now, but, uh, but advanced mathematics and statistics and engineering, I guess. Physics and chemistry. But equally, I was interested in English. And I'm going to come back to that because I think one of the challenges for, for the science and technologies is to remember that they're not isolated from society, but they're embedded in society. And one of the issues of the day for science is remembering science doesn't rule the world, values rule the world, what we think, what we believe. And therefore, how science and technology fit within the world depends on scientists and technologists not becoming isolated from society, but being engaged very properly with society. And so I think the need to keep an awareness, even if you are a scientist of the humanities, and if you're in the humanities to keep an awareness of the scientists, sciences is a really important thing. And why I say the latter? Because, of course, science and technology are at the heart of the solutions of many of the global issues that all of us face now. Climate change, living in more urban and urbanised, dense environments, dealing with um, energy, water and food security, and so forth. And many of the real public debates that people who imagine are going to be leaders or hope to be leaders in their society are going to be engaged with are going to be about the use and the limits on the use of science and technology. Think about it. Think of the two most intensive debates we have had in New Zealand in recent years. And in fact, at a global level. One is about genetically modified organisms and genetically modified food. Here we have an exciting and important technology a technology that has made an enormous difference to our understanding of biology, the human genome project, all the stuff that goes on around molecular sciences, where we can produce a large amount of food by genetically modified approaches. But at least in New Zealand, that technology has been rejected. The major reason that technology has been rejected is a set of values-laden beliefs. The role of big industries like Monsanto in controlling the global food supply. I'm not saying these are right or wrong, I'm just telling you what the dynamic has been. Uh, the belief that things that are natural are, are better in some domain than things that are synthetic. That's been effectively a debate between science and technology in one hand and values on another hand. Let's take another example. Climate change. What's the debate about climate change really about? All said and done, the bulk of climate scientists for a long time have accepted that anthropogenic climate change is happening. There'll be some debate over the rate of change, how rapidly uh, uh, planetary climate is changing, there will be clearly debate and uncertainties about some things at a regional level, and there'll be some, uh, then there's by definition uncertainty about complexities, the role of clouds or the role of uh, heat sinks in the ocean or so forth. But the science and the scientific consensus that the world is due, warming due to anthropogenic climate change is real, it's clear. Why then has there been such a debate? It's been presented as a scientific debate, but it's not really a scientific debate. The real debate is one about values. Does this generation have to make some economic and related sacrifices, which in the end will be for the benefit of your generation or your children's generation or your grandchildren's generation? In other words, or does this generation wait and hope that the problem 
not do anything and hope the problem goes away or there'll be a technological uh, solution in the future. Again, you see that science and, and technology are not independent of societal values. Here we have the science of, of climate change not leading to global action because of a whole lot of values debates about the economic equity of this generation versus the next generation. Now, I'm not going to go on about all of this. All I'm saying is, just because some of you are training in the sciences, and just because some of you will be training in the, in the humanities or the social sciences or the broader area, doesn't mean you should be ignorant or not take an interest in the other things that are not being, you're not studying for exams this year. Because if you are to be an effective citizen in this or any other society in the future, you're going to have to have an understanding of both science and technology, because they're going to have so much to play in what we do in the future, and the values of society you live in. And so to be a leader in society, you need to hide that in the future to be comfortable in both worlds. So just because you're doing exams in one world, don't ignore the other world. So how do I come to all of this? Well, I started life at grammar, doing the sciences, went off to university, thinking I was going to do mathematics. I went to university and I started doing mathematics at university. And why did I choose mathematics? solely because I'd been my best subject at, at, at grammar. And I thought, therefore, if I was good at mathematics at, at, at grammar, it would be the thing to do at university. So I went and did And after a series of lectures, which I found infinitely boring, learning, it took three hours, I remember, to prove that in every circumstance, bar one, which is something to do with imaginary numbers, that A plus B was B plus A, uh, I realised that if I was bored by a subject, even if I was good at it, that was not the way to build a career. You've got to have fun. You've got to like what you're doing, or don't do it. That's what you leave school, anyhow. Um, so I switched. And I switched, not knowing quite what I wanted to do, to at least allowing myself to do a biology degree, starting on a biology degree, because <coughs> I knew nothing about biology. Because in, in the 1960s, when I went to grammar, biology was not taught to A-class students. It was not considered a subject hard enough uh, for A-class students. And I realised that this was something which really turned me on. I had never really understood about evolution. I really knew, except for sort of form three, form four, what do you call form three now? Still year nine, three and form four. Form four, four. okay. Um, sort of drawing pictures of the cell, you know, with that chloroplast or the mitochondria or whatever in it. I knew nothing about biology. I had a series of great lecturers in Zoology 1 at Auckland University, and I realised that I was actually wanting to be in some form of biology. And in those days, biology meant biology, biochemistry, or possibly medicine. And I went into medicine knowing that I wanted to be a researcher. I never went into medicine believing I was going to be a clinician, a primarily a doctor, practicing as a doctor. So I went to Dunedin, learned about a few things about life outside high school, as any student who goes to Dunedin does. Um, got thrown out of Carisbrook a few times with bad behaviour. Uh, and then graduated in medicine and found I was a very good doctor. And so I imagined I was going to be training as a paediatrician, which is the area of medicine I particularly liked. When a person who was then the professor of endocrinology, that's hormone medicine in Auckland, said, Peter, 
I need a young person who's interested in young people and children to come on me with an expedition. I just got married. I was doing my one year of registration, which was critical, because unless you'd finished that one year of registration, you couldn't write a prescription on your own. So, but in the middle of that year, when I should have been thinking about doing it, I was asked to go off to the Himalayas for three to four months on a medical research expedition with Sir Edmund Hillary, another old boy of the school, to study why it was that there was so much goiter and, iod and cretinism, which is a form of uh, brain damage due to iodine deficiency in the Himalayas and the Sherpa people, and see what we could do to help them. So I gave up on, so married a few months, so goodbye to my wife, uh, uh, it was an, it's come to my point, it was an opportunity I couldn't refuse. It was a thing to get into research in a serious way, early on, go off with some great people, Kay Abbotson, I think another old boy of the school, the Professor of Endocrinology, Ed Hillary, myself, spent, gave up on getting my registration as a doctor at that stage, go off to Himalayas and did some really important research where I learned a lot about myself and what it takes to be a researcher. Patience, perseverance, the fact that every experiment you do will go wrong ten times before it goes right once, all those sorts of things. And I learned to think for myself.